Hello, hello. We are, uh, we're live. So we are going to um, have a conversation today. And we are going to be talking about um, being black in white spaces. So my name is Wendy Whitmore. Um, <laughs> I am the owner of Truth Healing and Evolution Counseling Services. Um, wow. I didn't prepare for this live. If you're, if you're joining, uh, turn down your volume because it'll create feedback between the live from Facebook. Yeah, there you go. All right. So um, I wanted to do this because not only am I a mother of a black son, but I'm also a therapist. And one of the main things that we want to make sure um, <clears throat> as parents and for me in my field is to address the truth, right? Hence, you know, it's so funny that the name of my private practice is Truth Healing, you know, evolution. You speak the truth, you heal, and then you evolve. So we're going to be having Miss um, Tori. Um, she's going to be moderating because I needed some guidance on this. There was just no way that I could have this conversation with my son um, without having somebody here to moderate. So first, I want to start out with, um, first of all, saying thank you for joining us. If you are watching, please start a watch party. Um, we would love to broaden our audience. If you are on Facebook, start a watch party so that we can reach, you know, as many people as we can reach. Um, but first, I kind of want to start off by sharing a story um, about what it's like being black in white spaces. So <clears throat> last night, you know, as I was thinking about this topic, I was thinking about the fact of how I was raised. And so I was raised in Los Angeles. Um, the beginning parts of my childhood. And so my mom heard about this program where they bus kids from the inner city to San Fernando Valley. And um, I'm a very theatrical person, as you can tell. And so my mom sent me to a um, performing arts elementary school. Well, in the 80s, we're talking 1987, 88, um, there was not very many black kids going to school in the valley. And so in second grade, I had a black teacher. And so I think that she kind of shielded me in a lot of ways. Third grade, I did not. And so we went to camp and there had been this boy um, in my class that had been taunting me all school year. And so we went to camp and me and him had gotten into it because I was kind of an athletic kid. And so I could beat all the boys in running, right? So I had beat him at camp in some game. And he was mad about it. He was, he, was, he was big mad. And so as I'm getting off the bus, when we're getting back to the school from camp, we were gone for a week, he rolls down the window, he spits on me and calls me a nigger. My white third grade teacher did not grab him. So she sees me running up to get back on the bus and she grabs me. And I remember my mom getting there to pick me up and they had me in the office. He was not in the office with me. And that's what it's like to be black in white spaces, y'all. Like I was eight, eight years old and there was no one there to protect me. And I think back to being a mother and you know, you live in certain areas, right? Because you feel like you're going to get um, better education for your children. You're going to be able to buy a home. And so when I was 14, my mom and dad moved us to Rancho Cucamonga. And um, I went to Alta Loma High School. I was the first senior. I was the first black senior class president. And um, I'm going to just say his name. Tom McNally was not feeling it. You know, he, he, it's just everything black bothered him. Um, we chose not to stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. We chose not to stand for the national anthem when we were, you know, young and black and trying to, our voices to be heard. And they tried to suspend us for that. Tom McNally tried to suspend us for that. Like, why? We weren't bothered. It was a peaceful protest. And he tried to suspend us. I, I tried to break up a fight between his father, which is now my he was my boyfriend, now my husband, um, and another classmate, because I'm like, it's our senior year. And I ended up getting suspended trying to, trying to problem solve. 
And they wanted to take away me being black senior class president. I mean, not the black, but being the senior class president. And I mean, I just think, wow, like when you're black in white spaces, even as a child, you just feel unsafe and unprotected. So Tori, I'm gonna let you take it away from here. Everybody, this is my son, Jalen Burrell. Hey, how you doing? And um, we're gonna have a candid conversation. Ms. Tori, take it away. That's difficult. That's, I'm so, I'm supposed to moderate. I know you're trusting me to do this, but you tell this story and it just puts me in a space. So the, the question for you first, I'll just base it. I'll just, I'll, I'll put all my energy in the form of questions. <laughs> the question for you first is about this collective trauma. Cause as you're telling the story, I'm recounting things that have happened to me. I'm sure other people who are listening to this are recounting things that have happening to them or have happened to them. And then we're also thinking about what we're seeing on our, on our news feeds right now. And so this collective trauma is real. So I think my initial question is just, you know, how do we process the collective trauma? Because it's not even, it isn't necessarily even on an individualized level. It's, it's the collectiveness of blackness that's being attacked, right? right. How do we start to process that? So <clears throat> I'm going to answer that question first as a clinician and then just as a mother, what a black son. So <clears throat> as a clinician, um, I think one of the things that I would really love to remind everybody of is to acknowledge how you feel and acknowledge um, your own trauma compiled with the trauma of maybe your children or your mate or the people you're intimately connected to and then what's going on in the world, right? Like you gotta acknowledge it. Like I see so many people trying to pretend like it ain't happening. Right? Like, like recognizing it, people always say it's half the battle. I say bull crap because we can recognize something and then put it on the back burner and act like it ain't even there. So first you recognize it and then you acknowledge how you feel because it's the acknowledgement of your feelings that's important. Right? We have to acknowledge how we feel. Right? And a lot of people don't want to acknowledge how they feel because it's hard, man. I I've cried so much in the last two years of just collective trauma with losing family members and then that triggers other memories and then my kids and then, you know, anybody who knows my story knows that I have four heartbeats, one biological child, but they're all my children, right? And so they have trauma. And so just to acknowledge that it's real and to sit with those feelings, right? And then that's after that, then we process it. And the way that you do that is you talk about it, you reach out to professionals, you, you participate in therapeutic experiences, whatever workshop you can find, whatever um, webinar, live, that helps you process your feelings, be, be there, be in that space. So acknowledge, process, and then reach one, teach one, y'all. Like once you, once you figure out how to sit with your feelings, and then process them, you got to go out and share this with other people. You can't just keep it to yourself, which means that we got to reach one, teach one. And then actually, as a mother, it kind of is in alignment with that, right? Having conversations with your children. Having convers if you're not a parent and you work with youth, having conversations with the youth to hear their perspective, right? Because now you have to acknowledge how you feel about that. You got to process that. And then you teach them how to reach one, teach one. I was so proud of my kids for being out there at the peaceful protest right near Victoria Gardens in Rancho Cucamonga. I mean, if they do nothing, well, of course I want them to do more in life. But that, that was, um, I think, doing something about the collective trauma instead of just sitting back and watching it happen and unfold, um, being a part of the solution. Jalen, how you feeling? Um, about what she said or everything in general? In general. Um, I hate it, honestly. I didn't feel comfortable at the peaceful protests because I, I saw a lot of people out there that I personally knew who were out there just for the clout or to post it. 
So a lot of those kids out there, I just, I didn't believe them. And a lot of the people honking by and driving by, it's still hard to believe them. Why? Because once you, like, if you see somebody, you know who's driving by and they're honking, saying they're, they're there for the cause, but you know they're not, it's hard to believe that the next car is there for the same cause or that they're believing the same thing that everybody else is there for. Okay. How has it been in this age of Black Lives Matter, in this age of, you know, racial trauma, this new age of racial trauma continuation of what we've been going through, how is it like for you navigating schools in particular? Um, my first instance with race, with racism was that I can remember was in elementary school. There was this kid, Michael, and you know, it was Matthew, yeah, Matthew. And he was always, he was always doing something. And then one time I just had enough of it. He called me a nigga and he kicked me. So I caught his foot and I threw him at the wall and I just walked away. And somehow I ended up in trouble and I'm in the office and he didn't get in trouble. His mom was supporting him on the sideline, clapping. I'm like, what? And this was third, fourth grade, maybe? Third grade. Third, yeah, th third grade. And I'm gonna blast out the names and not to blast them. Let me, let me rephrase that. I'm not gonna say the names of these people in these schools because I'm trying to blast them. I'm saying it because it's the truth. He went to Donia Merced um, Elementary School and um, the principal, Ms. Schlappy, calls me. And I'm like, so what about the kid that provoked this? And the crazy thing is he had been doing it since kindergarten. And I had been complaining and complaining and complaining. But it's not seen as bullying, I guess, because, you know, he was making comments about, you know, why is your hair not nappy? Because he has really curly hair. Like he was saying stuff like this. Or how can you afford to have so many pairs of shoes? Like just, just, and I would constantly complain about this kid. And you know which which and this is why i'm asking questions about education and i won't spend the whole time on this but just as an educator as someone who works with young people my curiosity is about how adults and in these institutions can support your experiences right and already you're telling me you haven't felt safe in schools the folks in schools have not held people accountable when they exhibit racism against you um, so let, I want to dig into that some more. Like what, what should schools be doing right now? Has your high school released a statement? Has your district released a statement? W if they did, would that mean something to you? Like what should schools be doing to support you right now? As I know of, the school district hasn't said anything, but I know that there's been a few teachers that have, have, that have publicly stated that they're supporting the cause and I know, and I know them personally. I've had them as teachers. And if I haven't had them, I've been in their classroom, talked to them and all of that. So I know that I can trust them and what they're saying. What they're posting. So those are the teachers that you would find me going to during lunch or after school or before school. But then there's other teachers who are just, you never really know what's going on. And they're just silent with every situation. It doesn't matter if it's race, bullying. So those are the teachers where it's like, so where do I go if I'm in your classroom? And what, what am I supposed to do here? And then there's proctors. All the proctors that are basically black. And then there's a few Mexican ones. So those, the proctors, everybody, everybody's sure with them. Those are the ones who are always helping you out. So everybody goes to the proctors before they go to administrators. Like that's common knowledge at this point. It's because they're of color. Yes. And they're trustworthy. You see them talking with kids and the proctors are coaches. So you already see them if you have practice with them. So you already have a bond with them. So, it, so administrators, we don't, we don't go to them unless it's bullying. But even then, it's like, what are you going to do? They're just going to sit you in the office and then give you a suspension and nothing else is resolved. You know, um, and then I want to acknowledge uh, Stephanie. She's also a therapist um, and she has two black sons. Um, uh, so, and also to kind of get my head in the right mindset for today, um, I did a talk at Upland um, High School. It was for the entire Upland School District um, called the African American Boy, um, Big Boys, Black Boys Cry Too, right? The African -American, Boy, African American Boys Experience. And so I rewatched it, right? Um, I did the talk and then I posted it on my YouTube channel. And so I rewatched it. And so it was interesting how, like, a year and a half ago, I was talking about safe spaces, right? 
and I mean, I know it's not a new concept or anything. Um, and so what I was sharing is that you are the safe space, right? A lot of the, 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 the teachers and, you know, it was all of um, Upland Unified School District um, employees were asking, like, what do they do? And I was like, you are the safe space. Like, you're, you're looking for an answer. And I'm saying you're the safe space. When you see something going on with a child, acknowledge their pain. Stop pretending like what's going on in the world is not affecting these black girls and boys and these Latino girls and boys and these Muslim girls and boys and these Native Americans. Stop acting like that. Stop walking into the classroom and you want to teach uh, the Scarlet Letter and you don't want to acknowledge anything else when you see that the class is struggling. Specifically when they get to about middle school and high school where they're a little more articulate, we're talking about their feelings, right? Create the safe space. Create a space of comfort and love. Elementary school teachers, create safe spaces. Incorporate um, world events into your lesson plan that are relevant to what's going on in the world, especially with the kids when you have kids of color in your classroom. Stop acting like ICE is not a big deal to a Mexican child that has immigrant parents. Because it is. They're not trying to learn five times five and learn their multiplication table when they're worried if mommy and daddy is going to be taken from them. Like, let's acknowledge that and let's talk about it. Do you have something to say about that, Stephanie? I want to kind of bring you in. and You just not kind of be sitting on there. So. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. And um, Wendy, it, it's a pleasure meeting you. And um, it's so great meeting you as well. Um, First of all, I just want to say that what you're seeing is absolutely 100% true. Um, and interesting, the way we met was because of what you were saying was really, it just spoke to my heart. And um, I don't know her personally, but I literally messaged her and I was like, we need to get together and we need to figure out a way to have these conversations. Um, I absolutely agree with you. I think one of the things, I live in the Valley, you know, I live in Burbank, California. Um, I was born and raised in New York. Um, and, you know, unfortunately, what I think happens in society is that our white counterparts don't think that we can be black and educated and live in a good neighborhood and still be able to coexist um, peacefully. Right. And so I've always lived in when I since I moved to California, I've always lived in the valley. And so I've always was that person in all my honors and AP classes. That was the only black chick in the classroom. You know what I mean? And so. Um, I had to work harder than anyone else in the classroom. My hair was nappier than everyone else. And so you, you feel like um, you have to work twice as hard just to be a part. And it wasn't until I had my son, my eldest son, who's 16, who's doing a community service um, project right now. So he would have been on, but um, he's not here. But it wasn't until I had my son, and my son is smart. You know, I, I we... As African Americans in general, you know, we are the type that speak to our children and we don't do the baby talk. And so my son at a very early age was very well spoken and 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 was able to engage in conversation. And so when he went to school and he transitioned to that, it was, oh my goodness, like there was this surprise that black folks know how to behave, quote unquote, right? Um and, and it just, it baffled me. And, and one of the things that you were saying, doctor, is I, I remember an incident, incident, my son is an athlete, um, and he was in elementary school, and he was in fifth grade, and he was on a traveling basketball team, and he got in trouble for playing basketball at recess. Reason why is because he was making the shots, he was, you know, passing the ball, making the shots and doing all this. And his teacher came to him and said, you're going to be suspended from playing. And he was like, why? You know, I've always taught my, my kids, like, if, if something happens to them, it's okay for them to question as long as they're being respectful. But he, he was like, you know, why? I'm not doing anything. I'm just making the basket. And he, and the teacher had the nerve to say to him, the reason why you're going to be suspended from playing over here is because you're making too many baskets. You're winning too much. 
And I remember my son came home and he was like, he was crying. He was like, mom, all I was doing was playing basketball. Like you, you sent me to play basketball. Like, why are they taking that away from me? And so, you know, me, I'm the, I'm the black mom that's in PTA. I'm the black mom that shows up to all the white events so that you can see like, Oh, you're not gonna, I'm going to have a voice. Even if I'm the only one, I'm going to make sure that your experience with me is going to be different. And so I spoke to the principal and her response was, well, are you sure she meant it that way? Like she diminished it. It was like, she didn't really say that. And I was like, let's call the teacher in, you know? And, and so it's, it's moments like that where you feel like, why aren't you trusting my word, number one? Why isn't my word good enough? And why do you feel, just because you feel a little bit threatened by me doing something well, you want to take that away from us and now use it as a negative, right? And so I think, I think when we're able to have these types of dialogues, when we are able to say, truth is truth, wrong is wrong, right is right. And I'm not going to be the parent that's going to just allow you and be the yes, sir, yes, ma'am type of, you know, attitude and not challenge you. And I think that what happens with, I have a lot of all different, you know, I have all different nationalities and I have some amazing white friends, amazing Hispanic friends of all cultures. But I think one of the things that I've, I've learned is that they feel uncomfortable with having the conversation because they don't want to offend you or feel like they're on one side or the other. Like they feel like they're betraying their one side if they agree with you. And then they feel, they don't want to feel too black, too white, whatever that, that stigma is. And so I find that they err on the side of silence, which is so detrimental and one of my friends who's Asian and she's a teacher, I, I, I posted um, I posted your video, video, Dr. Whitney, and one of the things that she said was, it's so true, you know, what you're talking about. She was like, and I'm trying to do something in my classroom to change the dialogue. And I think the reality comes down to what she said was, until the people that are not being affected begin to speak up, is that's when we're really going to see the change. And that was powerful to me. If you're not affected and you just sitting there like, oh, it don't matter to me, right? Like, I, it's not my skin that they're coming after. It's when our when our other races begin to speak up and say, yo, that's wrong. Does it seem like people are going to really pay attention? You know. Yeah. I think one of the things I'm I'm struggling with in this conversation is why we keep coming back. Um, and this is something, you know, Wendy, you and I have talked about this, you know, very personally as to why I kept coming back. But I think as we're, especially post COVID-19, as we move into that era of starting to rebuild and reimagine, that's been like my theme this year is reimagining. Um, why should black people go back to schools? Why, why should we go back to spaces where, where they're not gonna keep our babies safe? To spaces where, I mean, we gotta worry about our kids on the streets already. Now we gotta send them to, the, to somewhere every day, six hours a day, sometimes if they're in sports or after school activities, eight you know, hours a day, nine hours a day, we gotta send them there to deal with these folks and they gotta be damaged. We gotta be worried about them damaged on the streets. We gotta be worried about them damaged in schools. Why are we sending them, but why are we divesting? Why are we divesting from schools? You know what, I think that <laughs> it's so funny cause I, I've been saying to my kids for the last, since May, I, I feel like, uh, of, of course, Black lives are being taken all the time. But just the month of May has just been, it's just been. And I've been saying, if I knew 15 years ago what I know now, um, we would have started our own schools. And if that hadn't happened, I probably wouldn't be raising my children in the US. I'll be, I just, and, and I've had friends say this to me, you know, over the last few years. And I think it's because, you know, specifically because like, for example, my grandmother was born in 1921, my grandfather and 
1914, my mother's parents, um, and my grandmother's mother was born on the tail end of slavery. And I think for me, I know that we were raised um, to kind of embrace the American dream, right? Like, like they, like a lot of times when I think back to like my grandmother and her siblings, um, you know, they were raised by people who were raised by slaves. Does, does that make sense? So that mentality gets passed on. Both the good side of it, right? That's where we get the resilience. But the other side of it is put your head down, work hard. Um, and I think it's hard to break away from that, right? I mean, my son is about to be a senior. My three, my three oldest heartbeats are all girls. You know, they're in college. And I think, God, if I knew then what I knew now. You know, because I don't I don't feel safe. It's not even like I feel safe when my kid goes to school. None of them. I don't. I don't. Because I know that living in Rancho Cucamonga, I wasn't protected. Chafee Joint Union School District did not protect me. So I can't believe that they were ever going to protect my kids. So I was the active parent. I was there on campus all the time. And my kids, I, you know, I don't know if they really understood it, but, you know, I, I would make my work schedule around them. I'm at everything. I'm at everything. Not just because my voice should be heard, but I need to make sure my kids are protected. The first thing when my kids said they were going to the peaceful protest yesterday, my husband was like, I'm going to protect my babies. Because that's how we feel all the time. All the time. It's not that we're overprotective, that we don't want them to spread their rings and grow and move out of state and go to other countries. I want them to do that. But there is this fear that when they do that, will they make it back home? Yeah, that's the truth. That is, that is, a, these are facts. Um, and I think that, you know, one of the things that you know, to answer your question, I think, why do we send them back? I think it's a, you know, kind of a double-edged sword, right? Because I think that we send them back to let you know that you can't push us out, right? That's one, that's one perspective. But the other perspective also is your whole, like for me, and, and this is my truth, for me, sometimes I'm hoping that I can be the change. Like I'm hoping that my kids are going to be the example of showing you like, what you don't get to do like my kids are smart they're intelligent they're well spoken and they're good black kids that get good grades you know not because of anything that you're doing we're partnering obviously but because of the hard work that i'm doing at home and so you know one of the things i'm on, on in the process of doing right now is opening up my own school right and you would never not believe the struggle that that is you know for an african-american woman to sit up here and have this educational plan um, and, and the way that I want to, the school that I want to open is I want to open up a school that has the academic component, but also the mental health component weaved into the school system. Because what I feel like is having a school counselor there on a Tuesday every other week is not going to address the needs of our babies. And what I, what I know as a therapist is when when you feel better you do better right if you got all this stuff going on at home if you got all this trauma going on at home you are not going to perform well and so then you have all these behavioral plans and ieps and all these you know kids that are labeled with adhd when in actuality you know my my middle son has adhd and that's a true diagnosis right like i understand that and i'm you know i was that mom that was like oh he's just a boy you know he just needs to get out but i understand like there are chemical imbalances that my actual son has but you know and we have resources and he's doing wonderful now but the reality comes down to when you begin to label these young black boys as they have adhd they have autism they have all these things um when in actuality it's none of those things it is just you have the inability to um really process their energy and utilize it in a positive way or you're not educated enough to um instill in them the proper way of doing it it becomes frustrating and that's why i think you know like your son wendy like I, I i tell my kids all the time you know you are somebody's example 
you are somebody's older, right? You got to look out for those younger ones that are coming up. And what I mean by that is the example that you set is going, they're looking at you. They're looking at you like, oh, is he going to pop off at the mouth? Is he going to cut somebody out? Is he, is he, or is he going to be the kind person? And I, and you know, we had in our era growing up, we had a great example of, you know, the Martin Luther Kings and the Malcolm X's, right? Um, where there's like two extremities. But I think that we are at a place right now where how can we merge those two into one and really be about that life, letting people know that we are not going to be silent. We are not going to be quiet. However, I'm going to conduct myself in a way that you're going to listen to me. And I'm going to say things that are going to catch you mentally and emotionally where you're like, oh, they're speaking truth, you know? And so I, I think that like to answer your question, the reason why I keep on sending my kids back because I know my level of involvement. Um, uh oh, she froze. Accountable, but I also know that we have a very flawed school system. Very flawed. And so I can talk about the flawedness or I can be the change. And so pray my strength as I forget, figure out this school because it's, it's a necessity and, and it's for out of the box learners. It's for, it's for the kids that can't sit in the classroom for eight out or six hours and, and have a book. It's, it's going to be very hands on, very, you know, very much um, stimulating because I think that that's what we need. That's how the kids learn. It's going to be student centered, but I think that just like you young man, I don't know. What, what was your son's name, Wendy? I'm sorry. I'm Jaden. Jaden, young, I, just like you, Jaden, you you said some powerful things, and I think that your generation needs to hear your voice, and your voice is powerful. And when you understand that your voice is powerful, it's interesting. When we begin to know who we are, then our posture changes, right? Our attitude changes. Our shoulders, you know, are are put back. My grandmother grew up around slavery, but she knew who she was. She had big hips and she had a, a strong back. And she put her head back and was like, we're going to do this. And so she moved into white neighborhoods and made the change to the point like now, or back then prior to her death, the white people were like, oh, we, are, we respect you so much because she set a standard. You understand what I'm saying? And so we have to be that change. Um, and we have to look people in their face with confidence, letting them not be able to take our, um, our heritage away and, and create their own version of what feels comfortable to them. Right. Does that make sense? Right. I, I agree. And I commend you on the school because I, I truly feel like um, being black in white spaces, um, it's a compromise to our mental health at times, uh, physical, like all of that. And so um, the only way to be black in white spaces is if the white spaces make the spaces safe, right? I, I wanna ask you, Jalen, um, do you feel safe when you go to school every day? Aside from the mass shootings, which is what white spaces want to focus on, they don't want to focus on the microaggressions. They don't want to focus on all the other stuff going on in the world with people of color. And I'm not saying that the mass shootings are important. I'm just saying that it's easier for them to focus on that, I think, than it is for them to focus on these other, these, these other issues that are just as important. So, Jalen, do you feel safe um, as a young black man going to school in the suburbs? Not necessarily, but once you find your group of people or the teacher or teachers or administrators or whoever you find and you stick with them, that becomes the safe place. So last, last school year, first semester, I was on independent studies. So I only had to be in a classroom for a few hours a day. So most of the time, I was in another teacher's classroom or I would walk to go get something to eat. And when I would walk to get something to eat, I would notice that there's always somebody watching. And there's always cops patrolling, patrolling around schools because that's their, that's their schedule and that's what they're supposed to do. But a few times I would be tailed the whole time while I would go get something to eat and tailed the whole way back. And I would always take an alley 
just because I just didn't want to be followed. But somehow when I come out the alley, there they are in the corner of my eye looking at me parked. So it's not, I don't necessarily feel safe. And even when you're walking with a group of people, it's, it's different because at Upland, there's, there's the different communities with, within Upland. When you go to lunch, there's the black people are in one area, the Mexicans are in one area, the white people are in one area. We're very separated. Nobody's really together. And the only time people are together is if it's like a sports group, like football or track. And even then, all the track people don't hang together, but all the football people do. But they're all black or Tongan or Samoan, and there's very few white people on the football team that up or Mexican. So it's different. And you can always see where the administrators are when they're at lunch. And you can always see where the proctors are when they're at lunch. So it's not, it doesn't always feel safe. My, my question is, if you, I want you to freedom dream with me for a minute. If you could have your ideal school, if school, if, if you could build a space that was the most welcoming, most loving, most affirming, what would it look like? What would be there? Who would be there? Um, an HBCU, honestly. Like, I know if I don't get into a school that I want to get into for college, I'm going to an HBCU. Like, I've already made up that decision. FAMU, Howard, like those, those are the schools that I'm going to, no matter what. If I don't get into Texas A&M or like Ohio State. Or get school, in or get a scholarship from? Both. Scholarship. But like if those, aren't, if those aren't the schools where I know that I, like I'm definitely going to be taking official trips down to both HBCs and PWIs because I want to get a feel for how it, I want to get a feel for both of the areas. But that's, that's my, those are my types of safe spaces that I want to be around black people. And then when I do, when I am at like a, when I'm at school, I'm always in two different teachers' classrooms, Mr. McGee and Mr. Osmore. I've had Mr. Osmore, he was my freshman um, English teacher, and he's always been there no matter what. So. Why do you think that those, and I think, even for you, Tori, because you, you know, you're a teacher. Um, I think that when you talk about the ideal setting for school, I think that um, teachers of color are extremely important. Um, administrators of color are extremely important, but specifically in the suburbs, not just in San Bernardino School District, where they're more prone to hire black and Latino principals and administrators, Chafee Joint Union School District needs black administrators. They, come on now, like, they, we, come on, Upland, you need black principals and Latino principals. At, you, like, really, like, come on, like, how do you create a space for everybody when everybody that makes the rules don't look like the people they create the space for? I don't even understand how that works. Like, it doesn't it doesn't work. Uh, and come on, come the- on. Let's get with it. Let's get with it, Chafee Joint Union School District. Let's get with it, Central School District. Let's get with it, Altaloma School District. Let's get with it, Upland School District. And I'm not shouting y'all out to make you feel bad. I'm saying if you go create safe spaces for these children of color, make sure the administration reflects that because the perspective will never be in the room for the decisions if they don't look like the kids you're trying to serve. But even That's a fact. Like administrators, they're not always they're suck ups. Well, I think, and you know what I think about that, son. I think that they're afraid because they're the only ones there sometimes, and they and they don't want to lose their jobs. Yeah, I thought about that too about the idea. And actor, actually, Dr. Cornell West talked about this on CNN yesterday. Yes, part of it is fear. If you're the only one, you do have to watch your back because you know you got there, and so how do you maintain that? Right. But at the same time, too, Dr. Cornell West was very specific in saying once some of us uh, attain a certain level of money and professionalism, um, you know, we have to we we have to protect ourselves and protect and keep that. Right. And that also that usually means negotiating our values and our identities to appease white folks, to 
try to make them feel better, to try to make them feel like, you know, people used to say to me, like kids would always say to me in my classroom, like, oh, you should be the principal or you should be this. I'd be like, y'all, do you really think I would make it? I wouldn't make it because the minute, the minute I said something affirming toward black folks or affirming toward queer folks or took a stance on something, they, that's it. I would be done. It would be a wrap. They don't want me there. Right. Um, and so on one end, again, it's this constant battle of, yes, I want to be in that space. Like Stephanie was saying, because I want to disrupt and I want to like, you know, change attitudes. But then the other thing is to your point, Wendy, about our mental health, how do I maintain being that only one? Right. You know, it comes down to, it comes down to, I got to pay my bills. So I either think of, just think about that. I'm here to make money, pay my bills, take care of business so I can take care of my family. Or I'm, I got to stay safe, right? And I don't want to have an arrow at my back constantly because I called someone out or I checked someone or I corrected someone. I mean, I spent my entire teaching career fighting more of the folks outside of my classroom than my students because of just speaking up and just being honest and, and, and affirming of marginalized young people and saying like, no, we can't do this. This program is trash because it doesn't consider this or it doesn't think about that, right? Um, and so I had more arrows at my back from my own colleagues and the administrators that I worked with than I ever had problems with kids. And after 15 years, I finally got tired. So I couldn't imagine, I couldn't imagine being a principal where you got to think about parents, communities, superintendents, students. You got to think about all these different factions. And in the, in the, in the IE, we're in a conservative area and those voices speak loudly. Yeah. So our principals will be, be afraid to say anything that was too liberal because those parents will come out of the woodworks and act a fool. Yep. And the black parents would be like, you know, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a smaller percentage of us, right? So we can complain all we want, but at the end of the day, these white folks got numbers and the principals have to pay they have to move in that direction, whether we like it or not. And that's one of the reasons why my question was so candid about when do we divest? Like at what point do we just build our own systems? Because we know that those systems aren't meant to serve us. Right. But I also think that, you know, I, I love it, Tori, I love your perspective. You would definitely be someone I would hire for sure. But the, the reality comes down to this. And, and, and this is where I feel like my, my fight and my perspective is set. I am the type of person that I'm going to continue to stay in those spaces because I want you to know that I belong here. I worked hard. My degree is just as valid as your degree, if not more, right? And so when I have conversations with principals and district, you know, and LA, because LAUSD is a whole different beast, okay? There's a whole different beast that I, I can't even begin to talk about, Um and and get a part of but i think that when we when we stay the course i i know that it's tiring you know what i mean and I, and i get that i get that we are tired that there's not enough of us but the reality comes down to if we keep on having like there's three of us on this zoom and i, I i'm not on facebook so i don't know how many people are on facebook but if we just keep it between us then we we want to make the change that's not where the change is really going to happen and so i i'm that that um person that's like i'm gonna stay in your space i'm gonna make sure that you maybe you feel uncomfortable that i'm in your space but i'm gonna be here and i'm gonna keep on moving myself up the ladder so that you have a different perspective so don't ever say that there wasn't a different pers perspective in the room you know what i mean and i think that that's where we maybe sometimes lack because, and, I, and I, I i respect Jaden saying you know he wants to go to hbcu that's great. I, 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 I will be excited and, and celebrate you when you get there. Not if, but when you get there, right? But we have to have people talking about that. I didn't, ha I, I didn't have those guidance counselors at my you know, school, at Van Nuys Performing Arts High School, telling me, oh, you, you can go to Spelman. I had to apply for Spelman myself. You know what I'm saying? And my mom wasn't that person that understood education like I do today because they had to work. You know what I mean? And so how do I prepare my son for that? And how do I prepare my black son for dealing with this very real world um, in, in a way that not only allows him to be comfortable in his blackness, but also 
be comfortable in his skin, period. And no matter what corporation or what, um, what environment he's in. And, and one of the things I realized in having conversations with, you know, brothers, they're just like, unfortunately, that's not, that's not the reality. It's not the reality. You, you're, you have to, you're going to have to teach your son something different because of how society has already set it up. And as moms, we can be, I don't know what it's like to be a black man. I know what it's like to be a black man, a black mom of black sons. And that's a whole different heartbeat that, you know, no one maybe understands, you know, but my sons, you know, I have to teach them different things than I'm teaching my daughter. I, I, I'm not teaching my daughter when you go to the store, make sure you bring a receipt so that you can see a timestamp on it and make sure that, you know, you look in people in the eye and, and, you know, I, I'm, I'm not teaching her that should I like you know what I mean like it's just it's it's I, I I refuse to be moved from spaces that I know I belong in you know what I mean and so that's that's my argument I guess I think as a as a therapist um I mean I agree I've lived in the IE raised my family you know I grew I went to high school here and then went to college came back bought a house set up my business right here in the Inland Empire right um in the suburbs I think, though, as a therapist, what I want people to remember is that when we choose to be in these spaces um, that are white spaces, we have to take care of our mental health. Like, there is no, that's non-negotiable. I talk about barriers and boundaries, right? I say boundaries are things we set, but they tend to be negotiable. They can move, they can flex, but barriers, God dog it, your mental health, right? And we call it wellness because people are comfortable with wellness. Right. And, and, and I use the word wellness, you know, for marketing purposes, because it makes people feel better. But point blank, period, mental health, take care of your mind, because if you don't take care of your mind, your soul will forever be unsettled and it will affect your spirit, which is the character and the essence of who you are. And you're going to be pretty messed up because you're going to get tired. Like everybody's like, I'm sick and tired of being sick and tired. Absolutely. You are. But you know what I will say? So am I, but I, I still have joy and it's not because I'm a therapist. Well, that might be part of it because I kind of know what to do, but it's also because I make sure that I take care of my mental health. I cry when I need to, I release it when I need to, I process it. I don't let it sit back here in my subconscious and pretend like it don't exist so that one day it can start creeping forward and I'm having a mental breakdown. You have to take care of your mental health. Black people, we are. If you are in white spaces, if you are entering and and living inside of and working and working with in white spaces, take care of your mind. See a therapist. If you don't want to go every week, at least go quarterly, once a month. Right? You need somebody to dump those emotions on, and then they help you process what the heck you're feeling. So that you're not bleeding on everybody else because we need you. How you gonna reach one, teach one, and your mind ain't right? Right. And we also need to get out the mindset. Sorry, we also just need to get out the mindset that what happens in this house stays in this house, right? Because I think that so much we so much we were raised that we don't talk about anything outside of this home. Mm -hmm. The reality is we we really gotta start talking. And my my motto that I use with my clients is a better me is a better we. You know, if if I'm not good, n we ain't, none of us are going to be good. None of us. You know, airplane mode all day long. Make sure that mask is on you first before you out here trying to do something else for anybody else. So I, I agree with you, um, Wendy. So absolutely. I was just going to say Marshawn Lynch, take care of y'all bodies, y'all mentals, and y'all chicken. <laughs> Right. Um, the great philosopher right there. But I, <laughs> I was also going to um, I was also going to say, though, just note that the conversation that we're having, though, it does speak to a universal black experience is also very rooted in middle classness. Like we are in middle class spaces. We are professionals are the children that y'all are raising our children are professionals. And so, Jalen, that was going to be a question that I have for you is as you navigate these white spaces with other black children, 
do they do they also have um, a connection to blackness? Like, uh, because one of the things that I've noticed sometimes with some of these middle class black kids is that they're very uh, cosmopolitan, right? Um, you know, just sort of fitting in with everybody else. And so, my question is more about: Are is your experience um, the same as uh, not the same? I know we all have different experiences, but how are you interacting with other black kids who are middle class, who are in the suburbs? you know, whose parents are professionals and have a little money, are they seeing the world in the same ways that you're being taught to see it? Um, most, <laughs> most black kids, they are very whitewashed that I know out here. And Explain that. It, it annoys me because they always want to have white friends and mesh with the white people and is that bad to have white friends it's, it's not it's not bad it's just i don't want to deal with the parents and the grandparents of the white people. <laughs> and okay. i i just don't want to deal with that because it all trickles down to you and when you're with your white friend and something pops off and they're not there to support you i can't chill with you anymore and that's what scares me to have white friends but with black people they just want to they always want to be with them or they have been around them for so long that their white culture is a part of them. And I wasn't raised like that. I don't want to be in a white space. I don't want to be like the average white person. I want to be all my friends that I've person that I have personally made, they know themselves. They don't try to suck up to the white folks or to the white people, however you want to say it. But they don't try to be with them. They know they know that they can be friends with them, but they know their limits. You know, as his mom, um, and 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 living out here because I lived out here, I went to high school out here. I um, I always struggle with, you know. Of course, we can't choose our kid, our children's friends, right? Um, but I always struggle with, you know, his friend group and how, you know, because hip hop culture is so huge, um, you know, how easily, uh, white kids use the word nigga. And so, you know, because I'm on campus, because I go to all his events with all my kids, I was at everything, right? With all, all, all four of them. Um, I would hear it and I would always ask them, like, do you let your friends? Like, and so they were always like, nah, but, the, but people that they're close to, they're, they're black friends will. Oh, I mean, you know, it just ain't no big deal. And I'm just like, I don't think you understand that you know they they want to be down so they want to use words and they want to be like you know you know out here with roddy rich and i like roddy rich and da, 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 da. but at the end of the day like are they gonna film you or are they gonna stand in the gap and help protect you right so you know i want him to have a collective of friends culturally, um, non-gender conforming, like all of that, right? I, re I do. But I do struggle with, with the white friends because I always say to him, like, you know, are they comfortable? Are they gonna let their kids come to your house the way they want you at? Because he would have little friends at elementary school and they'd be like, oh, Jalen can come over anytime. But then, you know, when Jalen would invite them to his house, they don't come. So Jalen gonna eat casserole at your house. You gonna come here and eat greens at my house. You know what I'm saying? Like, I don't feel, I, and that bothers me. It's like, you want us to be okay with letting our kids play with your kids and come to your house and do sleepovers at your house. But when, when Jalen invites you to a sleepover, oh, you know, it's always something going on. And so it's kind of like, you don't want to tell them not to have white friends, but it's almost like, like, don't put my back up against the wall as a parent because my they going to only be school friends. Because if your kid can't come to my house, my kid for sure can't go to your house. So. Yeah. <sighs>
I have a, 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 a one last question for y'all, like a really important question. How, how are you, how can you raise free black kids? And with everything that's going on, how is it possible to raise free black kids? Black kids that love themselves, know themselves, feel affirmed. How can you, how can you do, how, how? Just to talk about the possibilities of that when they're seeing all this and you wanna raise them to feel confident and, and love themselves and safe, but then you know you also have to keep them safe Talk to me about that process of, of what it's like to try to raise free black children. Stephanie, I'll let you go first and then I'll close it out. Yes, ma'am. Okay, but you know, for me, I think that the, ra the way I'm raising my kids um, is really not about, it's really not about their, um, it's not about their, like their bodies necessarily being free. It's really about their minds being free their spirit being free, understanding that people can try to lock you up on a whole bunch of levels. But if you have that willpower within yourself to let them know like, Hey, you don't, you don't get to control my mind. You don't get to control my heart. You don't get to control any of that. Um, that's how I feel like they walk in their freedom. Um, you can have chains off of me, but I can still feel like I'm free. You understand what I'm saying? Um, and I think I do that by having real conversations with them about who they are, how their how their manhood and their their skin color through history is a reflection of power and and kingship and authority and understanding when to utilize that authority for good. You know what I mean? So I think for me, it's just teaching my boys who they are. And, you know, for me as a believer, like teaching them like who they are. And Christ with who they are, and, you know, in 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 their group setting, like you are just as good, if not better. Um, but when you remain humble and you, because this is the thing: the the moment that you got to start promoting who you are, then you kind of lose the value of it, right? Like I'm the man of this house. The moment that someone comes in there trying to do that, then you're like, yo, well, maybe you're not because you have to let me know. But when you can just walk in that um, innately, um, I think that that's where freedom comes in. And I think that's where some of the bondage maybe also comes in through other people. They're like, what? He, he is so confident with, within himself. You know, it, it makes him feel uncomfortable. So that, that's what I'm teaching my children. Walk, in, walk with your head up. Know who you are. And know who, and as a mom, making sure that I'm speaking life into them on a regular basis and speaking life into their soul so that those seeds are being planted in them that they know. I know that you said this, but my mom told me at a young age and my mom told me at, in the elementary, middle school or whatever, who I am and who I am. Um, so what you say is irrelevant. Right. So, so um, as, as a mom, you know, one of the things that I think is extremely important is making sure that um, I do teach them to be proud of who they are, right? Um, but I also have, you know, since they were very little, made sure that they were involved in the community. Um, when they were little, I drugged them to everything that was in the community, you know, like everything from, from jazz festivals to town hall meetings. Uh, when Jalen was 12 years old, Tori, you had him, you know, I've always encouraged them to be active, right? Um, and to be proactive um, as young black children. And so, and I focused on their mental health. All my kids have therapists and I've gone to therapy um, and I talk to them um, and I, I keep them around their elders, right? I would go pick up my grandmother when she was living um, and bring her to my house for a week or two weeks. You know, and, and, and they would just have conversations. And, and I don't necessarily know what she would always talk to them about, but just being around somebody who was born in 1921, who, you know, has lived through so much, um, has so much wisdom to impart. So I think, our, I think our elders, I think being involved in the community, I think um, having conversations with your children that are uncomfortable, sharing your experiences, making sure their mental health is taken care of and um, 
being involved with them, being present with them. Like my oldest played soccer. Soccer was not my thing, but I was a soccer mom. And I feel like that's important to just be present with your children and to show up so that they can know who they are. So no matter what, when they turn around and they're feeling a little uncomfortable, especially when they're younger, they know mom and dad are here, auntie and uncle are here, grandma and grandpa are here, um, you know, godmother, godmom is here. Um, and so as they get older, if we can't be present with them um, physically, we're present with them mentally, emotionally, and spiritually. So I hope that answered your question. Jalen, I want you to give us last words. What do you, I, I don't want you to talk to adults. I want you to talk to other young people. What, what do you want to say to other young people? For a lot of young black boys, I know that they're into the hype of being the next Travis Scott or being the next hype football player or track athlete or any athlete. But they, I feel like a lot of people lose themselves in search of that. So when you come across people who are like LeBron, Chris Paul, who are always going back to the communities, not enough people respect them for what they're doing off the court. So I just need, I, I just want a lot of black boys to actually understand that what they're doing off the court is just as important as what they're doing on the court. Wow. That's good, young man. That's real good. You should be a very proud mama. <laughs> Uh, man this is i i would like to i know that was the last word but i also want to say like i commend you for going live you know you don't know me from a can of paint like we could have been passing each other on this street but i feel like we have a forever connection now because you spoke up on behalf of what so many people are saying and i think that what happens i, I think this is so beautiful because what happens is that you don't need to know somebody. You don't need to know their life history in order to connect with them and, and link arms with them and say, you know what? I believe in you. Let's go. Let's go. That's why I was so passionate about getting in contact with you because I was like, I, I believe in what you said. It resonated in my heart. And if we would, as a community, begin to support our brothers and sisters out there, we would have a front line of warriors. And so I just, I encourage all of us to speak up. Young man, that, that was so powerful. Um, I'm so proud of you. I'm so proud as your auntie, you know, because <laughs> that's what we are, right? Um, as your village that you are going to do some amazing things in your generation and for generations to come. So don't be silent, be smart, be educated, but most of all, be yourself. Be who God created you to be and make sure that that voice is utilized to impact others because when you speak just like you spoke right now, I, you, I, I'm at attention. I hear you and I want to hear more. Um, and that's why I love working with you. So just continue on, young man, and, and, and thank you so much for this opportunity to partner with both of you. Tori, any last words before I close this out? Just, I love y'all. I love black people. I mean, for real. I mean, for me, that's, that's, that's a radical act to just love each other, to love ourselves, to be unapologetic about who we are. And that's it. And, and, and I think the other thing, if I was going to put a call to action, it would just be reimagine and divest. We, we have to figure out what we need to build for us um, and what that looks like. And so start, re start thinking, start, start reimagining. I think, I think for, for me, as we close out, um, you know, I, I, I've teetered with how vocal I want to be as a businesswoman in this community, right? Um, as a black woman in this community. And, um, you know, I feel like there, there was this moment where, you know, Wendy the therapist, Winnie the mom, Winnie the community advocate, um, Wendy the sister, the daughter, the granddaughter. Um, it was time to let everybody know what I'm really about. And I am about building community 
specifically our community, Black communities, and whoever wants to partner, then I want to make sure the Latino communities are strong. I want to make sure that all communities are strong. But first, I got to make sure that we take them care of first. Um, and so reimagining, when you talk about it, it's so crazy because that's like the theme, even for um, the church I go to. Um, we have to reimagine our spaces. And so, Tori, what you're doing and Stephanie, what you're doing and what I'm attempting to do, um, you know, is is important you know this is reimagining getting us together going live you know and talking about the things that we normally wouldn't talk about um and then what do we do past that and so i feel like honestly when my son said make sure that what you do off the court off the track off the field outside of the classroom you know i'm kind of adding to it shows up just as importantly um be about your community y'all be about us I love y'all. Blessings, everybody. And thank you, Tori. Thank you, Stephanie. Um, thank you, Jalen. <laughs> thank y'all, y'all. Have a good rest of y'all Saturday. Have a beautiful day, guys. All right, y'all. Peace. <laughs>